John Noe unveils Greater Than We Believe with your host, Stephen King. Welcome back. My name is Stephen King. This is my friend John Noe. We're so glad you came back again this week for another uh, portion of our series. It's the, the name of the series, or the whole thing is Greater Than We Believe. We have playlists, and this particular playlist we're on is called The All Controversy. And the individual part we're speaking about today is the post-mortem experience. That's today's discussion. In fact, it takes long enough to speak about this. It's going to cover five videos. This is part two. We discussed part one last week, introduced you to the idea. And so, John, we're going to pick up where you left off last week, uh, looking at the possibilities. Yes. And, uh, reveling in it a little bit <laughs> because God can do all things and we can't say absolutely that this is what he's going to do but we can we can sure talk about it absolutely and we want to talk about in this video the unhardening and regrafting process mm -hmm. in the postmortem and scripture teaches that at the pleasant time, this is in circa AD 57, the Apostle Paul wrote, if you would, uh, did I give you, no, I didn't give you that one, uh, that there is a remnant chosen by grace, and only the remnant will be saved. Hmm. Romans 11, 5 and 9, 27. Only the remnant will be saved. Well, there's more to this story than just that. Mm. I mean, yes, they will, mm -hmm. but stay tuned. The passage also teaches that for many thousands of years prior, God had hardened some people. John 12, 38 through 40. And it further reveals that he did this and perhaps still does this, that he hardens them. How yes. much, how much free will choice do you think a person has who is hardened by God? Not uh, much. Yeah. Not, not much. That perhaps he still does this by giving them a, if you would, Romans 11, 7 through 8. How does he, how does he harden this? By giving them a spirit of what? What then? What Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain. But the elect did. The others were hardened. As it was written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so that they could not hear, to this very day. Wow. Also, Deuteronomy 29.4, Isaiah 29.10, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Well, Stephen, ladies and gentlemen, if God has given someone a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so they could not hear, to this very day, what makes you think they're going to receive anything from him? <laughs> you know, positively, yeah. salvation-wise, in this life. Furthermore, he had broken off some branches. That's people. Yes. In unbelief. Why? So that other branches could be grafted in again. I'm not making this up. Romans 11, 17 through 9, if you would please. Oh, 17 through 9. Okay. Romans 11, 17 through 9. I'm sorry, I misplaced that because I thought I was finished with Romans. I apologize. Here hmm. we go. 11, 17 through 9. Mm -hmm. And it says, um, If some of the branches have been broken off, and you though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, uh, do not boast over those branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Hmm. Wow. Likewise, he had made some into vessels of honor but others into vessels of dishonor. Paul talks about in Romans 9, 21. Therefore, 
he had elected some like Jacob and not others like Esau. Mm -hmm. Romans 9, 10 through 13. That passage in Romans further relates that God loved Jacob but didn't particularly care for Esau. Mm, I think it says he hated him. But it, hated him? Yeah. So what kind of chance does Esau have? Well, comparatively speaking, it was hate, but it was not really hate. <laughs> <laughs> well, none of these unfortunate people at that present time back then were part of God's remnant chosen by grace. Yes. Romans 11.5. So seriously, brothers and sisters, let's consider for a moment, if God had done this to you, God had done this to you, do you think your human free will could override that? Could you have overridden his sovereign dis-election? Supernatural disabling you powers? Keep in mind that many of these unfortunate people had been, as of the time of this writing in Romans, had been dead for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Before the coming death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ the Messiah, had they not? But here is the good news, perhaps, mm -hmm. that it is also revealed in this passage. You ready for this? God is able to graft them in again. Mm -hmm. But how? Mm -hmm. After thousands of years, how? Probably by reversing what he had done to them in the first place. Mm -hmm. Does that seem unrealistic? Mm -hmm. So that they would no longer, quote, persist in their unbelief, Romans 11, 23. Where and when, Stephen, might, could, or may this happen? The only feasible answer is in the postmortem mm -hmm. afterlife. In the lake of fire. We're going to talk more about that yeah. coming up. How could this be effectuated, you ask? Simply but profoundly by God supernaturally reversing what he caused to happen in the first place. Mm -hmm. And what did he cause to happen in the first place? Stupor. The, the, the stupor and the hardening. Yeah. yeah. Right? By removing that spirit of stupor and by giving them eyes to see and ears to hear and by remaking them into vessels of honor. Mm -hmm. When he had previously made them into vessels of dishonor. Yeah. Seriously, if God can harden hearts, minds, feelings, and inclinations and break people off, can't he un unharden mm -hmm. and regraft them back in as well mm -hmm. in fulfillment? Uh, he desires that none should perish, but all should come to the, the, the knowledge of truth. And however all that is, we'll get to that again in a minute. Uh, most likely, this unhardening process, however, may not be a mere second chance mm -hmm. or another opportunity to repent and believe. Much more likely will be involved, especially if we view this process as the means by which this God disperses his mercy, grace, and love, as well as his justice and wrath, with the end goal being conversion of mm -hmm. all people. And for the unevangelized, those who never heard about Jesus mm. in their life and his salvation during their earthly lifetime, like the unborns and, and infants and children and mentally disabled and, and heathens in foreign countries or, or wherever, this process may simply and positively be one of bringing them into this light and love in kindly ways. Mm -hmm. Kindly and I would add loving ways or of imparting information and imparting education and enlightenment of drawing and enabling and leading them into a state of righteousness and maturity. But once again, just because somebody is physically dead hmm. does not mean that he or she cannot hear the gospel and be saved. See again, 1 Peter mm -hmm. 4, 6, for example. On the other hand, for the perverse, 
the Christ-rejecting group. This might be a totally different experience for them. It may be dreadful. Warning. It may be dreadful, even hell-like, so to speak. Perhaps this process will start with varying degrees of du duration of judgment and of correcting and punishment and isolation and loss and discipline and purification and rehabilitation in the lake of fire and described as a second death, Romans 10, 15, 21 through 8, to bring them to their senses before they enter into the information, education, enlightenment, drawing, and enabling phase. Do hmm. you think that's possible for God to do that? Oh, I think he can do it. And takes them into a state of righteousness and maturity. But somehow, within all of God's omnipower, Omni-knowledge, omni-love, omni-control. All non-believers might, could, and may be brought into the faith this very way. Do you think that's possible for God to do it? Would it violate any, anything he said in Scripture? It's absolutely possible. No violation. No violation. And yet God probably would not do this by overriding or violating what we think is a person's human free will. In other words, brothers and sisters... This conversion and salvation process post-mortem would not be forced upon a person against their will. It eventually would be freely chosen, so to speak, freely mm -hmm. chosen. Scripture also plainly tells us that, quote, no man can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Well, God can provide the Holy Spirit to mm. them, can he? In the post-mortem experience, sure. in the afterlife, as well as in this life. Can he not do that? Mm -hmm. Is there anything in Scripture that prevents him from no. being able to do that? Is the Holy Spirit not able to function in both realms? Mm. In the afterlife? Yep. In this life? On earth? And in heaven? Or where in the lake of fire? Mm. Admittedly, Stephen, this postmortem change of heart experience may not be pleasant for some, as God inflicts as much pain mixed with love mm. over different periods of time as it is necessary to bring about justice and repentance. And this process might, could, and may be applied again and again and again and more and more and more as needed to bring more and more individuals to die and come into it. Mm -hmm. So if, brothers and sisters, this afterlife scenario is correct, and I say if, this means that the vast majority of people who have lived on planet Earth will be converted to faith in Jesus Christ after death. Yes. Does it not? Let that sink in. And since faith is a gift of God, given only to some in this life, as God predestines his chosen and his elect, and somehow puts faith in their hearts and minds, he can simply and profoundly give the diselect this same gift of faith and graft them back in again, post-mortem-wise. Can he not? Thus, by loving, drawing, enabling, and awakening, and educating, and persuading, and or inflict, inflicting pain, and purification, and discipline, and, 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 and remaking them in a number of dramatic ways, God can, can he not, cause people in the afterlife to want to be saved, and be willing to confess their belief in Jesus Christ, and to freely trust him for their salvation the same as he has done for some in this life. Can he not? Mm -hmm. Graduation day. Mm -hmm. So when each person's time of post-mortem experience has been completed, and the time is right, and I have no idea how long or short that might take. It'll probably vary for each individual. He quote, makes all things new by finally drawing and enabling them to believe. John 6, 
44 and John 6:65. 6, and if they have been in the lake of fire, again, most likely mm-hmm. this is God. Mm-hmm. Hebrews, what is it, 12:29? Most likely this is God. They are transferred out of the lake of fire and into heaven. Once the lake of fire has done it, done its work. And this might, could, and maybe uh, an overview of how God's grace, mercy, and love, and justice, and wrath ultimately prevail as Christ eventually becomes the choice, the, the choice of everyone. And eventually how every eye encounters and sees him, Revelation 1-7. And how every knee bows uh, and every tongue confesses, either by their own free will or after God bestows faith upon them depending upon whether one is an Armenian or a Calvinist, of course, (laughs) or all the above, Mm -hmm. and more. Thereby, and in so doing, their post-mortem choice of salvation is made exactly in the same way as pre-mortem believers, like you and me, Mm -hmm. and perhaps most of you, as pre-mortem believers made their decision during their times here on earth yes. by responding and saving faith. And if this scenario, this life and the afterlife, if this scenario is correct, this could be how the redemption of all is made effectual in the three realms of in heaven, on earth, and under, under the earth. The earth. Yep. Philippians 2.10 and Revelation 5, 3 and 13. Obviously, then, and therefore, this process of bringing non-believers and even believers into unity with the Godhead would be different for different people, right? And no single innocent guilty sentence fits everyone. Clement and Origen were the first to teach and write about all this. And as far as I know, all sinners could be rehabilitated and ultimately find their way to heaven. Of course, their Christian universalism view was rejected by some in the church, some church leaders. But nothing, Stephen, I know of, do you, in Scripture precludes this from this scenario that we just covered from being a possible means that God could, might, could, and may use in his current and is currently using to accomplish his revealed will, desire, and purpose that if you would read his 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 revealed will, desire, and purpose that Second Peter three nine. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And First Timothy two four, if you would please. First Timothy two four says, "Who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth?" That's his desire, will, and purpose, right? Yeah. So can't, why can't he have his way? Why can't he have his way? Yeah. And if he predestined all these people not to be this, this way, hmm. you know, in this life, yeah. can he not redo that? Yep. Yeah. In the post-mortem life? So, does any does anyone of us think that the Godhead is too small or too ill-equipped to break through hmm. the hard and callous shells that some people have built around their hearts, minds, and bodies, or that he put there in the first place when he hardened them? Hmm. I mean, if, if God hardens you, you are SOL. Yeah. Salvation out of luck. In this life. Yes. <laughs> but how about in the post-mortem life? Yeah. Might be a new ball game. Absolutely. Uh, and they have repeatedly turned their backs on Christ during this life and refused to hear God's voice calling them to presence. But once again, the afterlife lake of fire may be a totally different story. Mm-hmm. And what kept a person away from God during this life may no longer be present Mm -hmm. or at least not possess the same level of importance, power, or attachment. Would you turn to Lamentations 3, 22 
20 through 23 and 32, another insight from Scripture may also shed light on this post-mortem scenario. Would you read that for us? Verse 22 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And then verse 32 says, Though He brings grief, He will show compassion. So great is His unfailing love. Wow. Mm -hmm. Much greater than, than we realize. Yes. Greater than we believe? Greater than we That'd believe. Be a good name for a series. Wow. Good point. <laughs> and because both God's compassion and, as Erickson talks about here in his book, uh, How Shall They Be Saved, and the will of God extends, he says, the will of God extends beyond this life. Yes. And he's told us what he wills, yes. desires for everyone. Rob Bell, in his book, Love Wins, <laughs> if you would read, please, on page 108, feels that... 108? Mm -hmm. In yellow? He says, no one can resist God's pursuit forever... Because God's love will eventually melt even the hardest of hearts. I love that. Do you believe that? Do you believe God is capable of melting? What is it? Do read that again. Melting the what? He says, um, because God's love will eventually melt even the hardest of hearts. And God, yet God was the one that hardened our hearts. Yeah. Yeah. So if he hardened, Why can't what's the big that? deal yeah. with unhardening? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, does, it, does he say any more on there? That's the oh, it makes finally makes perfect sense, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, scriptures like mercy shall triumph over judgment, James 2, 13, all of a sudden fit the scary scenario, yes. do they not? So in sum, Stephen, the reason God's mercies could, might, and may never fail and triumph over all sin and judgment is because they extend beyond physical, biological death into the post-mortem evangelism, purification, education, remediation, redemption. Since all are saved by His grace in like manner. Hmm. Like manner. How? God made them this way? Mm -hmm. Good and bad? God can unmake them mm -hmm. this way. Good and bad. Whether it's in this life or in the next life. Post-mortem. Hansen offers this potential, potentiality, if you would, read pages in yellow, 86 through 87. Pages 86 to 87. It says, For nothing can resist to the last. What? Nothing can resist to the last. The almighty power of divine love, which works not by constraint, which would be the devil's way, but by persuasion. You think God in the post-mortem post afterlife can persuade people? I would say yes. Wow. Well, for more on this, brothers and sisters, see see the last chapter in Hell Yes, Hell No. And uh, we won't go over all that. I think we've made the case. But again, we are not told how all this may happen. But we do know that, that quote, with God, all things are impossible. <laughs> all things are possible. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you were awake. Yeah. <laughs> all things are possible. Even this? Is possible? Mm -hmm. Well, this certainly is a big part of all things. Yes. Wouldn't you agree mm -hmm. <laughs> that they are? Interestingly, I'm going to close with this little tidbit. Milita military integ uh, inter interrogators, is that word, mm -hmm. yeah. now claim to know enough about human behavior that they also claim that they can win anybody over without using torture techniques. Hmm. Given enough time. Yep. So why do we humans, brothers and sisters, have a problem believing that the Godhead, mm -hmm. the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, can win everybody over in the afterlife 
given enough time. Yes. And again, we're living in the dot. This is the line. And the Godhead uh, certainly will have a lot of unlimited time. Yes. In the post-mortem existence. Yes. Would he not to undo the things that he did mm -hmm. when he put us here in a dot? Yep. Makes sense? Makes sense to me. Makes sense to you? Mm hmm. Well, more to come. Yeah. Thank you, John. Okay. I um, I was thinking about something when you were talking. I had to make a note so I wouldn't forget it. Mm. Have you ever noticed somebody is really good at what they do, but you want to watch them work? And see what see how like an artist or whatever, and they start doing things that completely look ridiculous. What is he doing? And he like an artist won't do it. Take a big old gallon of paint, just throw it on the deal there. And then you say, how? Whatever the person is doing, they're doing things that look completely wrong to you. I, that this is getting worse. It's not getting better. But someone else says, it's okay. There's a method to his madness. And then by the time it's over, you're in awe of what they've done. And you say, I don't know how it got to this point, but you knew what you were doing all along. I didn't see it. I couldn't see it. Now I see it. it. Makes sense. So when you say there's a method to someone's madness, in this case, I don't feel like God is mad, but some people may look at this whole discussion as madness because the Bible doesn't say it, and you're you're just you're you're pontificating and you're you're thing talking about possibilities and things, and well, even talking about the fact that God has hardened people's hearts, and then He's going to turn around around at some point and soften their hearts. Why would He do that? Why didn't just make them all soft to begin with and give them their own The thing is, there's a method to his madness. God has a reason for everything he's ever done and continues to do. Sometimes we look at him and we shake in our heads mm -hmm. and we're going, what in the world? This situation got like when I was in prison. I was praying and I was praying and it was getting worse and it was getting worse. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I knew he was there. I had faith. But it's like, I didn't see it getting better for quite a long time. Uh, but it, eventually, I realized that I was, I was learning some lessons I needed to learn. He was mm -hmm. purging me of some things I needed to be purged of. There was a lot there that I didn't know was going on that was going on behind the scenes. And there was a method to his mm -hmm. madness. And so when we're talking about things like this, too many people want to put constraints on God and say, he can't do this. He can't do that. I, I disagree. God can do anything he wants. And so I'm very happy to see that, that this makes so much sense to me, what you're talking about, the fact that he, he, he made these things this way for a reason. That's why when Calvinists talk about you had to be predestined for this, you know what? I'm, I've always disagreed with this whole idea of predestination. I'm, I'm run understanding now because of John's series and because of what he said. Predestination is the proper word because there are people that were predestined in this life to accept Jesus. The problem is they, they take that at face value and don't take it to the next step. Just because you and I and John and certain ones of us were predestined and we have accepted Jesus and now we are living in that kingdom now because we are and there are others that aren't, doesn't mean that their predestination is to be obliterated forever. That our situation that God predestined just didn't include them. And those who've been entrusted with much, much more much. will yes. be expected. Right. Which is another whole teaching. Yeah. yeah. So we that that basically it just I, I had to share that because sometimes people just sit there and they just it gets it seems like things are not only not making sense but they're really really you're not making a bit of sense and we just have to trust that God's in control. He's and got a plan. This is my father's world. This is my father. There you go. That fits perfectly. <laughs> But Come there's on. another world. Yes, there is. There's another realm. Yeah. Folks, we, uh, we'll come back next week for part three. Uh, we hope that you come to see us. Thank you. Please pray for our ministry, and we pray for you. We do every time we get together, and we're just happy that we're going to have a small part in sharing this good word. Mm. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Mm. All right. I have a better appreciation for the word predestination now. <laughs>
<laughs> well, you and I were. We have that that we can look back on and count on. Well, I had this idea that whenever Calvinists talked about predestination, that they were basically saying, you know, this predestination is for those that, that God chose that are alive in this life, and, and that, that means everybody else is screwed. Well, and that's, they, they that's got it problem. half right. Yeah, I was going to say, they, that's why I couldn't agree, I couldn't understand exactly what the scriptures meant by using that word, except that God, it was God's will that this, that, and the other. But yeah, makes You ought to leave this in that video. <laughs> okay. Hear that, ladies and gentlemen? We want, I'm asking Stephen oh. to leave that in this video. And now we're going to close the okay, video. Bye. <laughs>